America is the land of the minority, and the Second Amendment is the right that guarantees it. Think about this for a second. If you advocate for gun rights, you're fighting for the right of people who disagree with you, maybe even hate you, to own one of the most powerful objects on Earth. No other country empowers its minorities the way that we do. We defend minority speech, minority opinion, and yes, minority gun rights, because differences are the foundation of our greatness. Majorities, by definition, accept the status quo. Minorities change it. Since America's founding, we've produced more powerful individual icons than the rest of the world combined. People like Thomas Jefferson, who thought about freedom differently. Martin Luther King Jr., who thought about race differently. Or Thomas Edison, who thought about everything differently. People whose revolutionary ideas changed the rest of the world forever. In today's media-driven world, the only acceptable definition of minority is non-white, or sometimes non-straight. Of course, that's a complete lie, accepted by a majority of people who are too busy retweeting fabricated outrage then to consider the consequences of their actions. Our laws don't ensure the rights of the status quo majority. They ensure the rights of free-thinking individuals against the majority. No matter what's trending on Twitter, our rights are guaranteed, and our rights are individual. That means we will never be a population of faceless, featureless sheep stuck joining the flock to ensure our common defense. We are free to say what we believe, live how we want, and pursue happiness, however we define it. And our right to defend our lives shall not be infringed. No matter what anyone thinks about you, shall not be infringed. No matter your skin color, shall not be infringed. No matter what you believe, shall not be infringed. No matter your politics, shall not be infringed. We are the nation of shall not be infringed. It's easy to take what that means for granted. It's absolutely critical that we don't. As an American citizen, you can be whoever you want to be, regardless of if you're black, white, gay, or straight. And whoever you decide to be, you have a unique right to own a gun. So why is it that society continues to tell us that gun owners look a certain way or act a certain way, that they stay in line with whatever is assumed to be the majority? They don't. This fight is about giving power to the minority. You talked about initially, before you came out and been more public about your sexuality, how you, you had this apprehension about not wanting to come across hurting um, the, your culture, who you are. You didn't want to reflect negatively. And then eventually you started to realize that it's not the case at all. Right. right? And in a point that I'm trying to get at now as far as like with the gun thing, you know that a lot of people didn't really get down with guns the way I did. Right. You know? Because in our community, in the black community, it's almost seen as like owned by a particular group of people. Right. Only these dudes carried guns. Before anybody knew who the hell I was and I was really getting into gun stuff, it was like, oh, he's in that weird kind of like, I don't know what's going on with him. He's kind of doing it's this. It's like listening to country music and being black. Exactly. You can't do it because it's a, it's against the grain. Yeah, it's kind of like you, you step outside that box. Right. Then all of a sudden it's like, well, something's got to be wrong with you. Something's, got, mm -hmm. something's just not right. Right. Are we that close-minded? You know, my ancestry is Syrian. Syria right now is in a state of war, yeah. basically. And what really defines that is, you know, guns, weapons, having access to those things, right? Syria, before all this happened, um, would not allow you to own a gun. Now, the question is, had they had the ability to protect themselves, would they even be in a situation like that? Because even the dictatorship that's there was only possible because the citizens had no way to protect themselves. Are you familiar with the roots of gun control, so to speak? No. All right. So it's, it, it's actually inherently rooted in racism. Interesting. When slaves were freed, they were now, as free men, allowed to what? Wow. Own guns. Right. And so you had the Klansmen and Klans members and, and these individuals who were like, holy shit, we have a group of people who are probably pissed about being <laughs> right, <laughs> having, being having suffered for so long. Exactly. And now, not only one are we worried about retaliation, but now we are we are dealing with a group of people who very well may be able to exact a certain level of power that they we've never given. Them. Right, because those free slaves now having owned guns, chances are they would never accept returning to that situation exactly. again. Exactly. Which gave them freedom. 
And when they wrote the idea of the Second Amendment, that it, it wasn't applicable to black people. It was right. supposed to be for white Anglo-Saxon men, mm -hmm. right? And they understood that, that power, like you pointed out, mm -hmm. there was a power there. And that as long as we have the guns and they don't have the guns, we dominate them. There's a the superiority that comes with that. So then if you understand that the gun equates to power, mm -hmm. and back in a time when white supremacy was absolutely dominant and they understood the gun equated to power, why would you not then want the same power for your community? See, that's kind of a two-sided mm -hmm. question. If you have guns inside the community, mm -hmm. All right, you have soldiers, but you also need your generals to actually well, to regulate the people. Who's going to check the army? The idea of living in, an, in a society where I cannot check my government, right? I don't want to live in that society. Mm -hmm. Hence, gun control, which is, in many ways, can be argued as a euphemism for people control. Wow, that's, that's powerful. You know, most people that are for gun control, see, they get it, they get it, that misconception that somehow if I'm for gun control means because I'm against people dying. It has nothing to do with that. It's more about how that cause and effect of freedom versus peace. As soon as you start you know, regulating and restricting that, it starts to affect it. It always comes back to one thing, freedom. Not just for the loudest voice, the deepest pocket, or the status quo. Freedom for all. In our community, when it comes to firearm ownership, we're not very vocal about it. That's what the white boys do. Right. They, they're all Absolutely. about the Second Amendment. They're all about the right, as if everything in the Constitution only applies to them and it doesn't apply to us. Right. And I'm trying to figure out what, like, what, what has fostered that? Like, I think because just typically within our community, we don't hunt. Mm -hmm. And I think in other communities, particularly white communities, that is like part of their upbringing. And it is considered almost like a taboo if you do things that aren't deemed the black like, thing. Yeah. So I don't understand why it's that way, but for whatever reason, people don't ever think for themselves, have their own identity and own it. Mm -hmm. Where do you tend to sway as far as social issues? I'm in the middle because okay. I'm pro-life, I'm pro-gun. I, I, can, I can definitely advocate for education. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's really, I'm really split, yeah. honestly. So I'm really my No, friend. you're not split. You're <laughs> human. I think that's what makes you interesting. Mm -hmm. You are the epitome of an individual. A few years ago, I paid $35 for a Jennings J22. It's by far one of the cheapest guns I own. However, it's also one of the most endearing. I bought this gun for $35. The sights are almost non-existent. The trigger sucks. It's made out of cheap metal, and I'm pretty sure this is laminate. But there's something about it. There's a certain charm and character about the gun that kind of really speaks to me. It almost kind of looks like a Walther PPK if you kind of squint your eyes and tilt your head a little bit. I've shown you some drool-worthy guns this season, from fully auto and suppressed to highly tuned performance guns. So you might be wondering, why am I spending time on these things? Well, have you ever heard the term Saturday Night Special? Maybe not, but every gun owner should know it. Because back in the 60s and 70s, the anti-gunners tried to ban thousands of handguns for nothing more than being relatively inexpensive. They invented the derogatory term Saturday Night Specials to cast these guns in a bad, scary light. They called them junk guns and claimed only criminals used them. Personally, I think it was all an excuse to keep them out of those people's hands. And so did civil rights leader Roy Ennis, who called it racism at its worst. Of course, the claims about criminals were found to be flat out false by criminologists and law enforcement. You can't set an admission fee on freedom. You can't ban pencils because poor people might write with them. And you can't ban inexpensive guns because poor people might defend their lives with them. So here it is, the infamous high point chambered in 45 ACP, or as I like to call it, the tactical black beluga whale. And there you have it. This is exactly why this gun is so infamous. Granted, considering the guns that are available on the market today, this is an incredibly, incredibly cheap gun. Uh, you can find this gun anywhere for about $100, maybe even less. A lot of American citizens use and buy this gun because it's the only gun that they can afford. 
Not everybody can go out and afford a $500, $600 Glock. Not everybody can afford an $800 to $900 HK. So what do you do when you're in a position to only afford an incredibly, incredibly cheap gun? You buy a cheap gun. And the last I checked, the Second Amendment didn't only apply to people who could buy and afford a $500, $600 gun.